Yeah, good evening, everyone. Thank you again for being here today. It's been quite a journey in the book of James. After tonight's study, we will have one more study from this book, and then we will, uh, we will finish with the book of James, and I will let you know the next book that we are going to be studying next week. Let us pray. Father, we thank you because you have been with us from the very day one. We thank you because of every one of us who has been part of this journey. And Lord, we bless your holy name because you are revealing unto us the truths in your heart. You taught us what it means to believe in Christ, and how the practical experience of our faith should be reflected. This has been a great blessing to our lives, and Father, we are very, very grateful. Lord, we pray that tonight, as we continue to dig into your word, and particularly we look into what seems to be like a very strict rebuke today against oppression. Lord, we are asking that you will reach into the very corners of our hearts and you will open our eyes to see if there is anything that we need to correct, that we will make amendments like your humble servants, we will be obedient to you, and we will receive forgiveness. I ask that you will be with those who will listen to this message, even in the time to come. You will give us a balanced view of your mind and help us to pursue life according to your commandments. We bless you because we know you always hear our prayers because we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we are now in chapter 5, and James is going to be talking about oppression as God himself views it. But he's going to be looking at it from the standpoint of the powerful, the rich, the wealthy ones. So the title of today's study is God's Warning Against Rich Oppressors and a Call of Endurance to the Faithful. Now you will notice that before this chapter, James had mentioned in chapter 2, pointing out the evils committed by the rich against the poor. According to James, in this particular context, he said that they use their power. They use money to oppress the poor. They also dishonor the name of the Lord that the Christians profess. So he was warning God's children then and said, don't deal in partial ways with people. Don't treat the poor differently from the way you will treat the rich. But here he's going to focus very much elaborately on what he was talking about. So in James 2, 6 to 7, said, but you dishonor the poor. Who are the ones who oppress you and drag you before the judges? The rich. They are the ones who speak evil of that good name which has been given to you. We know that name, the name of Jesus Christ. Now, in chapter 5, James begins to write warning rich and oppressive individuals, calling them to repentance, because he said God will judge oppressors. But at the same time, he writes unto the believers who have been oppressed to be patient 
as they undergo persecution and suffering in the hands of the powerful and the rich. Now, there are three things that we are going to look at today. Number one, warning against the rich oppressors. And then second, we're going to look at sins of the rich oppressors. And finally, we will look at the exhortation to believers to continue to be patient. Now, let's go to point one, warning against the rich oppressors. In James 5, 1 to 6, he said, And now, you rich people, listen to me. Weep and wail over the mysteries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted away, and your clothes have been eaten by moths. Your gold and silver are covered with rust, and this rust will be a witness against you and will eat up your flesh like fire. You have piled up riches in these last days. Those are very, very serious allegations against anyone. And it is scary, actually, to read in this particular passage how the life of these individuals and even what eventually will become their lot at the end of life. So it is something that we need to really look into and wonder what exactly is James talking about here. Before we look at this warning, I want us to understand very clearly, and we had mentioned this before, James is not against believers being rich. So if you and I pray that God bless us and bless us a lot, we are praying according to the scripture. So we need to get that clearly. In Proverbs chapter 10 verse 4, the scripture says, being lazy will make you poor, but hard work will make you rich. And again, in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 19, it says, if God gives us wealth and prosperity, let us enjoy them. We should be grateful and enjoy what we have worked for. It is a gift from God. So let us get it very clearly that being prosperous actually is God's desire for God's children. It is a gift. So we should leave this study today and pray that God prosper me, prosper my children, prosper my family, prosper my church. It's a very important prayer to pray. But God warns against dependency on riches. God is displeased when Christians put their safety, their security in something else other than God. If we put our safety and security in money, or when we depend on money or material possessions for happiness, we are not actually aligning to the center of our creation. And something is actually missing in such a life. Number one, remember that we are created for worship. We are created. The scripture was very clear that even before the creation of the world, God himself created us, and one of the purposes of our creation is that we might become the object of God's pleasure. So the center of our creation, the purpose of our creation, one of them is to live a life of worship. So when we put our attention away from that, and we now focus on material things, we make money our idol. The Bible begins to tell us it is dangerous. God is displeased when we profit from other people's labor or sweat. 
Now, James is focusing a lot on this and getting any reader of the scripture in that time and in the time to come to really see through into the heart of God. God is displeased when we use our position to exploit others. So in this time, it was within the Roman Empire. If you look at the policies of Rome at that time, you will notice it is very much systematically exploiting either a set of people or the poor. It is systematically discriminating against a group of people, particularly people who profess their faith in Jesus Christ, and those who are very rich and powerful, like some of the Roman citizens and soldiers. They are extremely powerful people. They are paid very well. They continue to exploit and to explore the poor people such that the poor continue to live in a marginalized kind of system and environment. They hardly can lift up their own lives. The values of their existence begin to go down from time to time. And James was writing, and writing in this particular time, even for those of us who will live today. The scripture categorizes all these forms of ways of life as sinful, unjust, and unacceptable before God. He said, God will judge injustice. Now, number one, James came out very strong to tell them that I need you to pay attention to all these things. And I'm calling you to repentance because, number one, riches do not stop anyone from experiencing mystery in life. Riches don't stop anyone from living a miserable life. So there is this lie of the wicked one that will say, if I have money, I will find happiness. But we understand from experiences of life, it is a lie. Anytime I get into this kind of scripture, there is always an image that comes to me. I'm not sure, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later, whether you watched, uh, you have seen this movie, Titanic, that classic movie, at some point in life. I always look at that movie in order to understand some of these things that James is writing about. And there is always a particular scene that always gets me to this end. When everything seemed to have collapsed and the end of life seemed to have approached every single one of them. They knew that it's over. The ship sink and it's going to be calamity on every one of them. Life is coming to an end. And then you begin to understand the value of money. You see how people cause wealth and money because it could not save. Apart from that, I have seen quite a bit of people who had used their life to pursue life of wealth. And it is not something that God says we shouldn't do. God asks us to really work hard. But when I get a little bit in contact with them and we have conversations, the more it seems that the account is increasing and it seems that their money is growing, the more it seems that they begin to say, it's, there is something that I'm looking for and I still cannot find it. James write and say that whoever live a life of dependence on money and exploit others, even with such power, will be miserable. Look at what he says. He said, weep and wail over the mysteries that are coming upon you. 
He writes with a kind of prophetic inclination and said, I need you to take account of your life and look even into your future. There is something that seems to be coming upon you. It is mystery. And it is coming. You need to pay attention to it. In Luke chapter 6 verse 24, Jesus says, How terrible. For those who are rich now, you have had your easy life. But he said, Judgment will come upon those rich people who accumulate wealth for their own good, their own pleasure, and who do so at the expense of the poor. Number two, riches do not prevent anyone from experiencing calamity. James writes, he said, they will experience calamity. They will encounter calamity in varied forms, in diverse manners. Here on earth, it is going to be their portion. But again, it says even in eternal life, outwardly and inwardly. Within them, it said their lot will be mysteries and hell will be their ultimate destination. That's very scary. That is really scary. And it said worldly riches are of no value. Eventually, they will discover when everything has come to an end and they stand before the great judge. Their riches will be of no value because he said, your riches have rotted away. The treasures that they put their hope on will not provide them security and safety when they need it the most. If one has lived one's life for something, and ultimately, when it seems that that is when we want to hold on to it, that anchor cannot hold. It will be a life of mystery. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 4, the Bible says, Riches will do you no good on the day you face death, but honesty can save your life. In the very time, when it seems to be coming over and everything that we seem to have acquired, either illegitimately acquire it outside of the fear of God, of the understanding that with the best and the most sincerest intention, I have gotten this in the fear of the Lord. The Bible tells us on the very day of death, that condemnation, that condemnation will make anyone miserable. Now, I believe that these illustrations may not be too applicable to us. That's what I hope. That's the prayer that by God's grace as God's children, we know that God teaches us that we have to live honestly, and we have to deal with people sincerely and compassionately. We know that as God's children. But again, the word of the Lord is still very clear that we have to guide against any inclinations that we want to turn us away and put our hope in wealth or in things that are of material, material nature components. Part of what we need to understand here is this, that even as God has blessed us, and by the grace of God, that is our prayers, and we got the things of this world, God has blessed us with stuff like that. The Bible wanted us to understand one of the purposes is that those things will become possessions that are seen from the standpoint of worship. Worship to who? Worship unto God. Worldly riches. Worldly riches, God 
created them. God gave the wisdom to people who were able to invent the mechanism by which we understand wealth and money in this world. But as God's children, we need to understand the heart of the biblical God, the God of our faith. All of those systems are to be used by God's people to actually help the poor, the marginalized, that they will find value, that they will find dignity, that they will, by the grace of God, be able to say, we find hope, hope of our creation and hope of life to grow and to develop to become who the Lord wants us to be. Worldly riches will fade away when it is time to count the real treasures. James says, your clothes have been eaten by moths. What they place their happiness on will be of no value because it will fail them. I was talking about Titanic that uh, the other time. I went back again and I tried to out of many conversations between Rose and Jack, there was one that I just tried to, 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 to copy. And I, I want to bring the contest to you before I read this. Um, Rose was brought into what we can call worldly influence. I mean, she lived, if you have seen that movie, in, in, in riches. Sorry, what would you call that? It was, it was the wealth that we say the world can, avoid, can afford. It, it, it is beautiful when you look at it from the outward point of view. It seems as if there is nothing that she wanted that she doesn't have. But the more she began to live this life, look at what she said. It said she said, I saw my whole life as if I had already lived it. He said, an endless parade of parties and cotillions, yachts, and polo matches. I mean, who wouldn't want to live that kind of life? It, it, it was luxury. You will look at it from the outward point of view. You will say, this is heaven. But I want you to pay attention. He said, Always, I am with the same narrow people, the same mindless chatter. I felt like I was standing at a great precipice with no one to pull me back. Outwardly, it was as if this is the best life anyone can have. But inwardly, she said, I was like, I'm just being plunged into hell. And my life is rotting, and I am being destroyed. Those things that seem physically appealing outwardly said they are eating me deeply within. My life is being over. That is exactly what James is writing about. Because the creation that God gave to us, our invention, is not to find satisfaction in all these things that we are talking about. Our invention will only find deep union and satisfaction when we know the true God and when we submit our entire life to worship God. Can I say something? Money can be of extreme value. It could be such a blessing. I know people who are very rich, very rich. And when you talk to them, they will tell you, I am blessed. And it is not just saying it, you can see it. But what was the secret? Because number one, they realized that the money is not for their own pleasure. The money is number one for God's glory and for God to use it for his own pleasure. Last year, I was invited to join um, uh, some pastors in um, uh, New Brunswick. 
uh, my, my school nominated me that they, they think that I should go for this. And when I got to this leadership uh, retreat, there were about maybe 13 to 15 of us. We were brought to a particular island, and I have no idea of where I was when I got there, but I was only trusting because I said I'm with pastors. <laughs> but this is the place where you will find the people that they call the stars in the world, powerful Hollywood people. These are the places where they come. And, and the, the food they will give us for breakfast, if I finish that food, I can eat for the rest of the day. But the people who actually own that place, I understand the person who is the most, I mean, the leader of, of the team is a Christian. And each year, they are looking for, they, they designated a particular fund, and they're looking for ministers of God that they will sponsor so that they will come into that particular place and do a leadership conference every year. And that money will be given for them to use that. Now, I'm trying to tell you that this man that I was told, I, I can remember his name, I understand is one of the wealthiest men here in Canada. But they know that the money is to be used for the things of God. They know that this is to be used in order to gather by the grace of God treasures that are going to be of eternal value for the name of the Lord. Such people will find in the sight of God, they will find pleasure. And I saw the people who were walking in that very uh, place that we went, very well paid. Actually, they told us, don't give them any tip because they are very well paid. They're not exploited. They treat them very well. So riches is very good. God can bless us, but he wanted us to understand when we are blessed, we should know the purpose Everything about us, everything about we acquire is for godly, is for God's purpose, is for worship. Dependence on worldly riches will lead to an eternally lost hope. That's what James said, your gold and silver are covered with rust. He said, your investment will be devalued and your hopes will be dashed. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 20, Jesus repeated a similar thing. He said, do not store up riches for yourselves here on earth, where moths and rust destroy, and robbers break in and steal. Instead, store up riches for yourselves in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and robbers cannot break in and steal. This is Jesus Christ himself talking trying to pull the attention of his hearers again to the point of their creation, to the point of God's gifts and investment upon their lives. Whatever God has given unto you, we need to know, we need to use it for the glory of God. The rust of worldly riches, according to James, will be a witness against those rich oppressors and he said it will eat up their flesh like fire. You have piled up riches in these last days, he says. But he said their wealth will witness against them in judgment. It will not profit them. Instead, they will howl under God's judgment. The scriptures are very much what the Bible called the riches of the searching heart. And again, we come back to it again. Look at what the Bible says. It says, scriptures are nuggets of gold. These are the things that we need to invest our hearts on to guide us in the, in the path of life. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 4 to 5. It said, look for it as hard as you would for silver or some hidden treasures. If you do, you will know what it means to fear the Lord and you will succeed in learning about God. And finally, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, 
the message of Jesus Christ is Christ's message in all its richness must live in your hearts. Teach and instruct one another with all wisdom. Sing psalms, hymns, and sacred songs. Sing to God with thanksgiving in your hearts. This is the true riches of our creation. Now we go to point two, where he was talking about the sins of the rich oppressors. In James chapter 5, verses 4 to 6, he said, You have not paid any wages to those who walk in your fields. Listen to their complaints. The cries of those who gather in your crops have reached the ears of God, the Almighty God. Your life here on earth has been full of luxury and pleasure. You have made yourself fat for the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent people, and they do not resist you. Now, what is the sense of these people? They live for money. They piled up riches in the last days. And James says, the accumulation of this money for their wealth is going to be their condemnation. Their belly is their God. Their entire life is devoted to pleasure. The love of money has overtaken them to the point they have become like beasts in their thinking. They have no time for God. Rather, they dishonor the name of God. But listen to what Jesus Christ said about such people in the parable of the rich fool. Luke chapter 20, verses 19 to 20. He said, the man, the rich man says, I will say to myself, lucky man, you have all the good things you need for many years. Take life easy. Eat your life. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool. This very night you will have to give up your life. Then who will get all these things you have kept for yourself? Look at that. The second thing is this, they oppress the poor. He said, you have not paid any wages to those who walk in your fields. fields. You oppress the poor. You rejoice in their suffering. And this manifests in different ways in different culture. Uh, when I was um, uh, back, uh, either in Singapore, even sometimes here, you find it in different ways. There are people who will employ others outside of the legislative system. And they did it deliberately, violating the law, for example. But again, they will use that to eventually marginalize and exploit those who work for them. And in particularly when they understand that these cannot cry out because it was not a very fair and uh, legal process, they will manipulate, oppress them even to the core. The scripture says such kind of things is not good. First and foremost, we need to follow the order that we are given by the government. That is what the scripture recommends. Obey those whom the Lord has given unto you to be your leaders. But apart from that, in other cultures, it manifests in different ways. For example, back in, uh, in, in, in my culture, it is as if that the rich wouldn't want the, the poor to even be lifted up. If they, if they will pay them certain amount of money that will lift them up, they will deliberately destroy the opportunities that will come against them so that they can come up. God hates all these. And the Bible tells us that God will very much angrily deal with such kind of persons. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 13 says, if you refuse to listen to the cry of the poor, your own cry for help will not be heard. God hears the cry of the oppressed. Listen to their complaints. The Bible tells us the cry of these people have reached unto the almighty God. God hears them. And he said that you enjoy luxury and pleasure in this life, but you're making life very difficult for these poor people. And the Lord says, you are preparing yourself for hell because your valuables are going to be property that will eventually be the properties of your destruction in hell. You condemned and you murdered innocent people because they cannot resist you. You silent their voices. You kill the powerless. 
Your sins prepare you for the terrible judgment that is coming from God and that is going to come upon you. Very scary. And God is warning all these people, turn back to me and do what is right so you can enjoy the mercy of the Lord. But within all this kind of oppressive system, James now calls on the Christians in point number three and asks them to be patient. In James chapter 3, verses 7 to 11, he said, Be patient then, my friends, until the Lord comes. See how patient farmers are as they wait for their land to produce precious crops. They waited patiently for the autumn and spring rains. You also must be patient. Keep your hopes high, for the day of the Lord is coming near. Do not complain against one another, my friends, so that God will not judge you. The judge is near, ready to appear. My friends, remember the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Take them as examples of patient endurance under suffering. We call them happy because they endured. You have heard of Job's patience, and you know how the Lord provided for him in the end, for the Lord is full of mercy and compassion. Now here is this. God is calling unto the righteous people who are suffering under this particular oppressive system. He said, be patient. Be patient. Why should they be patient? He said, because their Redeemer will come for them. Their character of patience should remain in time of suffering. And he said, endure hardship in the light of the fact that Christ is coming. And he is the ultimate harvester, the great farmer, the one who will harvest into his kingdom the righteous people. And he was using the analogy of the farmers. He said, look at them. They will wait patiently for their crops eventually to produce. And he said, we shall learn from them. Anchor your hopes on the imminence of Christ's coming, he told them. He's reminding them of Jesus' words and even the, prophet, the prophets of old. For example, Isaiah chapter 2 verse 12 told them, he said, On that day the Lord Almighty will humble everyone who is powerful, everyone who is proud and conceited. Wait for that day. Don't take judgment in your hands. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 2 for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come as a thief comes at night. And he said, wait for that day. And I quickly wanted to mention here, because in these days, many people begin to wonder, especially in the time of COVID, and now when even there is war between um, um, Russia and, and, and Ukraine, people are wondering is coming to the end of the world. There is a lot of alarm. Jesus Christ told us, although my, my return is imminent, but he said, if anyone says to you in Matthew chapter 24, verses 23 to 24, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear. They will perform great miracles and wonders in order to deceive even God's chosen people. But he said, no one thing, this is just the beginning of the end. And again, he calls them and said, don't be a judge. Don't put judgment into your hand. Let God be the judge. Do not complain against them. Do not move around and begin to talk evil of them. He said, my friends, let the Lord be the judge. And what is James echoing? The word of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 2. Do not judge others, so that God will not judge you. For God will judge you in the same way you judge others, and he will apply to you the same rules you apply to others. Don't speak evil of them, but understand one thing, be patient. Stand for what God calls his own principles. Let the life we live become a kind of judgment against them. Let it teach them what it means to live as God's children. But let us understand one thing. They will not take away the faith, the beliefs, and the doctrines that God himself has taught us. And finally, he said, follow the footsteps of the prophets. 
They were models for us as believers. We can emulate them, but we need to understand the perfect example of the believer is Jesus Christ. He gave the example of Job, and as I end here, I want to say this. Job is a, is a wonderful example. I'm not sure how many of you have read the story of that man. If you read his life, focus on what it means to trust God or what it means to be a person of trust and focus on God's plan. Focus on God's providence. Focus on God's faithfulness and what it means for even believers to be faithful. When you study the life of this pain from all these angles, you will note one conclusion. God's caring plan remains for every trusting believer. God is ever merciful and compassionate to everyone who follows him. He, God, will not allow any of us to pass through any temptation that is beyond what his grace can carry us through. And when we feel affliction in the light of God's mercy, we will see that God will never leave us in the time of our temptation. We may be poor in worldly things, but we are the rich ones in the sight of God. And the scripture told us God will provide for our needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So as I end, here is what James is saying. You want riches? Pray for it. If the Lord bless you, enjoy it. But I want you to understand that all of this should be from the center of your creation. You are created to be a person of worship. Let all those things be used for the glory of God. And finally, if we happen to live within a system that seems to be very much oppressive, don't join it. Don't utilize it. Don't profit from it. Because we see the heart of God, how it is so, so much had, and the judgment of God is coming upon anyone who is an oppressor, who is an abuser, who profit on injustice. And finally, this is a call to repentance. If we search our hearts and we find ourselves in any of these, the Lord says he's calling us to repentance. And tonight we can come to the Lord and we can say, God, I'm sorry. If I have not robbed man, but I have robbed God, in the sense that I have not used my resources to place the priority of where they belong, we can repent tonight. If the Lord is saying that, I am not pleased with those who rob human beings that I have created, we need to understand what God is saying about people who rob God. And tonight, we can actually repent and ask the Lord to have mercy on us. Let us pray. As you will be going to a small group and we are going to be discussing now, I want you to ask the Lord. If there is anything that the Lord will want you to repent of right now, we can do that. We know we serve a compassionate God, a merciful God, that God have mercy. And let us pray that in our small groups we will enjoy God's presence and God's wisdom. Father, we ask tonight that your presence will be with us that you will turn our hearts. You will help us to understand who we are. Created for your pleasure. People who are loved from the very foundation of the world by God the creator. I pray that you will help us to really think about what the value of true riches are and help us and bless us tonight in the rest of the time we have in Jesus' name. Amen.
Now, as we go to a small group, please, we can, um, I'm not sure whether all of us who were here last week are here, that we can maintain our small groups. You can be in that small group, and if you don't know where to go, you may want to join the groups that are less than five, if you were not here. With us tonight, God bless you.